Hey, welcome back to Cool Classics. Today we're going to look at the life and career of Fred Gwynn, best known for playing Herman Munster on The Munsters, but there's more to his story. I got some freaky facts, some cool clips. Here we go. He was born Frederick Hubbard Gwynn, July 10th, 1926 in New York City. His father, Frederick Walker Gwynn, was a stockbroker and a partner in the securities firm Gwynn Brothers. His mother, Dorothy Ficken, was an artist, and her friend, Minnie Maud Hanf, was a writer. They teamed up and they created a character called Sonny Jim. After having some success with their short illustrated stories about Sonny Jim and his bright outlook on life, which is sort of a take on the power of positive thinking and an optimistic outlook on life, they leased the character to Force Serial, and from there it just went crazy. Fred's mother was now designing the artwork for the boxes, and her friend was writing the little story to go along with the Sonny Jim character on there. One of them read, Jim Dumps was a most unfriendly man who lived his life on the hermit plan. In his gloomy way, he'd gone through life and made the most of woe and strife till force one day was served to him. Since then, they've called him Sonny Jim. Both the serial and the Sonny Jim character increased in popularity over the years. But at one point, a group of advertisers did a nationwide poll of most recognizable names and Sonny Jim came in third, only losing to J.P. Morgan and President Roosevelt. Now, eventually, the original artwork that Fred's mother had designed was changed to look more traditional with a little boy on the front, and the name Sonny Jim became its own brand and was appearing on everything from peanut butter to strawberry jam. So there's your little freaky fact. Now you know Fred's mother helped to create it. Now, Fred did have two siblings, a sister named Dorothy and a brother named Bowers, but both of them passed away at a very early age, so Fred was pretty much brought up as an only child. Fred, in later interviews, said that he remembered his early childhood as being very loving and nurturing with both his mother and father right there in the house all of the time. He said his father was a retired stockbroker, so it gave him a lot of time early on with him. But when he was eight years old, his father was suffering from acute sinus infections that lasted for months and months. Eventually, he underwent surgery to help with this, and unfortunately, he passed away on the operating table. Fred says that when he found out about his father, he remembers crying, and to him, it seemed like he cried for days. And his mother, she was devastated. She buried her husband, her son, and her daughter. All she had left was me, he said, and all I had left was her. Fred said at this point, he became very withdrawn. He wouldn't go outside to play with his friends. He wouldn't have them over to visit. He just wanted to stay in his room and read books. Now this went on for years, he said. I wouldn't leave the house. I wouldn't even leave my room. But my mother, who was concerned about me, would coax me out of the room and have me draw doodles with her. And this turned into little drawing challenges in the living room. Eventually, she would get me to go on the porch and paint with her. And this sort of got me reintegrated to the real world. And we would go places and draw little sceneries and paintings. And so my mother, through drawing and art, brought me back. Fred says that him and his mother were very fortunate because his father was so wise financially that he left them enough life insurance and dividend paying stocks that they didn't have to search for any extra income. They were paid monthly by some investments and quarterly by other investments to the point where they lived an upper class lifestyle. By the time Fred was to enter high school, he was no longer socially reclusive. In fact, he was more outgoing and he told his mother that he wanted to study art, which excited her, so she enrolled him at the Groton School in Massachusetts. This was one of the most selective private college preparatory boarding schools in all of the United States, so this was a big honor for him to attend. Now, to this day, it still ranked top five in the nation and cost over $70,000 per semester. I mean, hey, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt went there. While there, Fred started to study and excel at everything art-related, from expressionist art to self-portraits, even cartooning. He also joined the drama team, and by his senior year, he was just as passionate about acting as he was his artwork. 
Although Fred intended to go directly to college right after high school, World War II had broken out while he was in there and was now in full swing. And Fred really wanted to do his part for the nation. So upon graduation, one month before his 18th birthday, Fred went down and joined the United States Navy. Fred said that by this time he had already had a growth spurt and reached his maximum height of six foot five inches tall. And he said, boy, was I skinny. And they stationed him on a submarine chaser as a radio man reading Morse code. He says that the Morse code in the headset was so loud that it was giving him headaches and making him have trouble sleeping. So he asked to be stationed somewhere else on the ship, even if it was more dangerous, but he still wanted it to be very important. So instead, they stationed him topside next to the anti-aircraft guns, which he said were a hundred times louder than any Morse code. But luckily, they didn't go off that often. After two years at sea, the war ended and Fred was honorably discharged. When he returned stateside, he landed in Duxbury, Massachusetts, where he used a GI Bill to start studying art. And while he was there, he needed to earn money, so he became a swim instructor at the Duxbury Yacht Club. After a couple of years there, he went for an art degree at Harvard University, and this is where he feels he really became himself. He sang with the a cappella group, the Harvard Crocodilios, and he also became the cartoonist and illustrator for the Harvard Lampoon. The writers on the staff at the time were fellow classmates, John Updike and George Plimpton. Eventually, Fred became the primary writer, illustrator, and president of the prestigious magazine. Some of his political satire cartoons were picked up and published by mainstream magazines across the country. He was also the star actor of the college's Hasty Pudding Society, which is the oldest theatrical organization in the United States. And there, he perfected his comedy routines by performing in burlesque, dressed as a woman at six foot five. After graduating in 1951, Fred decided to stay in Massachusetts and join the cast of the Brattle Repertory Theater. Once on stage there, he quickly became the lead actor and standout star. They recommended that he go to New York and try out for Broadway. So he did. After arriving in New York, he started to go on auditions along with job interviews. And that's when he was hired by J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency, a very prestigious place to get a job. And he landed the job because of his artistic abilities. He was in charge of designing and creating brand logos and copywriting them. He worked there for four years. That same year, Fred attended a wedding for an old college buddy, and at the reception, he met Jean Foxy Reynard, granddaughter of the mayor of New York, William Gaynor. Well, Fred and her became inseparable, and within one year, they had their own wedding. The newlyweds moved into an apartment in Manhattan, and Fred would go to work and go on auditions. But every time he went for a part in a play, he was told the same things. He was either too tall, too skinny, or he had a lantern jaw that was just too big. Not one to give up, Fred continued on and he would take smaller roles off Broadway. And word quickly got around. He may be tall, he may be skinny, but he's talented. He said things changed all of a sudden in late 1952. I was actually asked to audition for a role on Broadway. I went in and auditioned for the part in the play Miss McThing, and I got the role, co-starring playing opposite actress Helen Hayes. He said this was a wonderful time. I was a young newlywed, madly in love, with a great career and day job. I was also in a hit play on Broadway that ran for 320 performances. It couldn't get any better. But it did. His wife was pregnant. And one year later, she gave birth to a baby boy named Kieran. The happy family had it all. Then one evening, a year and a half later, they were all in the living room when little Kieran pulled himself up onto the end of the couch and started to stand. Fred could see that he was losing his balance, so Fred lunged out of his chair to catch him. But it was too late. Little Kieran hit his head on the corner of the coffee table. 
The fall caused a subdural hematoma, and the doctors had to do an emergency operation to release the blood and the pressure off of little Kieran's brain. Despite the scar that went from ear to ear, they believed the surgery to be a success. But within a few weeks of bringing Kieran home from the hospital, he started to develop grandma seizures, and then epilepsy, and none of it ever went away. Although this was hard on both parents, Fred took it the hardest. He felt that he could have reacted sooner and none of this would have ever happened. So every time Kieran had a seizure, Fred would break down in tears and blame himself. Now, a couple years later, Fred was on stage in the play when in the audience was director Elia Kazan and he noticed Fred's height and he thought that guy would make a great henchman. And by the end of the show, he thought that guy's a great actor. And so he asked him to audition for a part in his new movie, on the Waterfront, starring Marlon Brando. Now this was a small role. He played a henchman and he was only in a few scenes. You can see him on the screen right now on the left. But again, he was asked to audition. People were noticing him. That same year, his wife Foxy gave birth to their second child, a daughter named Gaynor. Then in 1955, he got a call from the producers of the Phil Silver Show. They were looking for a great big tall guy that could also deliver comedy. And they said he came highly recommended. He went down and auditioned and he got the part of Corporal Ed Honigan, also known as The Stomach. Wow! Oh boy, he got the stomach. Who's the stomach? <laughs> the, the stomach, the, the eating champion of the United States Army. Gotcha. Choo, that's, choo, a, choo. that's a black-throated blue warbler. Latin name than Roica cerulicens. Breeds in deciduous and mixed woodlands from northern Minnesota through the Plains states. Unfortunately, the show didn't last that long for him, but he really didn't mind. This gave him more time in the evenings to work on his dream, which was writing and illustrating his own book. He also stopped going on auditions so that he would have more time to work on the book. And as it became closer to completion, he went ahead and quit his job at the advertising agency. This was a bold move, but it all worked out. In 1958, he released the book Best in Show, which was based off of pets and their look-alike owners. With his great content and the skills that he learned at the advertising agency, he was able to self-publish and get the book to crack the New York bestsellers list, which led to a major publishing deal and success nationwide. With his savings and the royalties from the publishing deal, he was able to spend the next two years creating more books, one of which was called What's Nude, which was a book full of racy cartoons for adults. So at this point, Fred was just a writer. He hadn't done any acting in over a couple of years, but then he received a phone call. It was from television producer Nat Hyken, who Fred worked with before on the Sergeant Bilko show. This time, Nat had a primetime slot on NBC Reserve for this new project, and in it, he needed a tall, comedic guy to play alongside Joe E. Ross, who was also on the Sergeant Bilko show, and this would be a co-starring, co-lead position. Well, Fred went in for testing, and the chemistry was perfect. So on September 17th, 1961, Car 54, Where Are You? debuted. Look at me. I'm six foot six. And five foot six of me is face. <laughs> you know what they call me in grammar school? Horse face. They just repeat what other people say. <laughs> right after the first episode aired, his wife Foxy gave birth to their third child, a son named Dylan. The happy couple moved into a new house and the show started to climb in the ratings. <laughs> At least you could have me put in some blueberries like I promised. <laughs> see them again. Looking back at the cast of the show, it was really loaded with talent. Just think, you had Nipsey Russell in there. Feeling better, Julie? Yeah. I think. <laughs> in 
And of course, Grandpa Munt. Oh, <clears throat> I mean, Al Lewis. Look, Gunther, I don't mind a good cigar after a meal, but not in it. <laughs> and playing Charlie the Town Drunk is one of my all-time favorites, Larry Storch. If we give you another chance, I'll never forget you guys. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. It's that Atlantic Bar and Grill, but I never go there anymore. For a quarter, they give you a shot like that. Boom. Who needs it? The next one I hit is that Mandalay Lounge. They give you a shot like that. Boom. <laughs> the next one I hit is that Ace of Spades Bar and Grill. For every two shots you buy, boom, boom. The bartender buys you. Boom. Blue Diamond Cafe. Now there's a bar. For every shot you buy, the bartender gives you a beer chaser. Boom, boom. You're gonna pass it right by, huh, Charlie? Who's gonna pass it by? Why don't you mind your own business? Sweet ass, What a classic scene. You knew I'd throw that in there. Now, sadly, on July 12th, 1963, Fred was on set filming Car 54 when he received an emergency call from his wife. Their almost one-year-old son, Dylan, had fell into the backyard pool and drowned. Fred fell to his knees crying and was inconsolable. The whole cast and crew felt so sorry for Fred and his family. They all paid their respects and Fred took two weeks off of work. When he returned, he came in with a smile on his face joked along with the rest of the crew and went through the day as if everything was okay so no one mentioned anything but they did notice in the evenings once they wrapped the set for the day fred would walk out to his car with his head down looking very somber you see how fred felt that he could have done more to prevent the injury to their first son kieran his wife foxy was now feeling like she could have done more to prevent the death of their son dylan the strain of all of this was just too much. So what the cast and crew didn't know was that Fred and Foxy were going through a separation. He says that he felt very lost at that point, so he went ahead and just focused on work. And over the next two months, they finished production on season two of Car 54. Everyone was happy, but then they got the news. The show was canceled. Car 54, where are you? Needing to stay busy, Fred joined the cast of the Broadway production, Here's Love. And over the next few months, him and Foxy also reconciled and moved back in together. With life settling down, everything seemed normal. But then he received another phone call, this time from Hollywood. It turns out that these producers saw him on Car 54 and thought that he would be great to cast in this pilot episode to pitch to the networks to see if it would be picked up for television. He thinks this sounds good and he asks them, what is it all about? They tell him that he'll be playing a Frankenstein type of character. He replies, I'm a little taken back by that. I thought you liked my work on Car 54, not the fact that I'm tall and look like Frankenstein. And they said, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. This is foremost a situation comedy. Your height is very important, but your comedic delivery skills are more important. That's why we called you. Intrigued by all of this, Fred flew out to Hollywood and shot the first pilot for the Munsters. This was never shown on television. Check this out. Hi, Uncle Herman. Hello, Marilyn. I'd like you to meet my date. This is Jack. <laughs> oh, Uncle Herman. Eddie, would you come down here? I want to try this jacket on you. <laughs> Don't touch me! Let me... Let me go! Don't touch me! <laughs> Go right upstairs and get into bed. And don't forget to close the lid. <laughs> what do I know about young girls? Do I look like I went to charm school? <laughs> oh, will you stop this bickering? There's enough noise in here to wake the living. As you could see, things looked a little bit different in that pilot. Now, the network was happy, but they still weren't sold on the whole idea. 
They told them, go ahead, shoot another pilot, make a few changes, we want to see some improvements. So here's what they came up with. They all agreed that Fred Gwynn should stay and play Herman Munster, maybe just make some improvements on his makeup and costume. They also agreed that Al Lewis should continue to play the role of Grandpa. However, they did change out the actress Joan Marshall from playing the character of Phoebe and brought in Ivan DiCarlo to play the character of Lily. They also changed the character of Eddie, played by Happy Derman, to the character of Eddie, played by Butch Patrick. The character of Marilyn was also left unchanged. Again, she was played by actress Beverly Owen. The only thing different was the pilot was shot in black and white this time to save on costs. They still weren't for sure that the network was going to pick up the show. But they did pick it up. The only thing was it was with a limited budget. Not enough to go full color. You had to go in black and white just like the second pilot. But the budget did have enough money to give Fred star billing and the top pay. So he talked it over with his wife and they decided, let's move to Hollywood. So with the addition of some cool music, on September 24th, 1964, the Munsters debuted on CBS. Where did you come from? <laughs> Just teaching Eddie how to pole vault. <laughs> Uh, uh, do, do you see where, where the... <laughs> Would you do me a favor? Certainly, Grandpa. Don't ever take up bowling. <laughs> they like to say that 1964 is the year that television got weird. You had the Munsters, Adam's Family, Bewitched, Gilligan's Island, followed quickly by I Dream a Genie, My Mother the Car. I mean, you had Talking Horses. You had it all. It was a great time. I guess I'd better quit. No, Fred, you're not going to quit. But you know who did? Beverly Owen, who played Marilyn. She quit after 13 episodes. She was then replaced by Pat Priest, who went on to finish the series. All right, well, let's take a little peek here and see what we got here. For goodness sakes, what is it? Such imagination. Get a load of that schnoz there. <laughs> well, I really owe a lot to the model. But model? What model? What, what, what? Oh, well, my Uncle Herman, he modeled for me and I just sculpted. You, you, you mean to say that there is someone like this alive around here someplace? <laughs> oh, yes. Well, he lives at home with us and he's just 151 years old. Excuse me a minute, darling. I'll take this now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to throw that one in there too. That was Pat Priest and Harvey Corman. Make no mistake, Fred was the star of the show and Herman was the most popular character. Now Fred says that his job was to create this monster but make him lovable. And the only way he knew to do that was to channel his mother's mannerisms, voice inflections, and sometimes body language. And he says, I think I did a really good job. I brought him to life, and people loved him. Now, 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 everyone, just calm down. If you'll let me talk to him and you'll go in the kitchen, I'll handle this as father to son. I suppose you've uh, thought it over and have a very good reason for leaving your comfortable home and the people who love you. And uh, what is that reason? It's rotten here. <laughs> it's probably just another one of those adolescent cycles. <laughs> I believe a child psychiatrist would refer to it as the punk phase. <laughs> but he says Herman's laugh was something all original that he had to develop over time. You're going to be your daddy's big, smart, successful son. <laughs> hey, Dad, do it again. 
Now, the show started off super popular, and it climbed in the ratings. The demand for the actors to make public appearances was also pretty high, but Fred couldn't go to these public appearances because of his makeup. His was the hardest to do. He had to sit in the makeup chair every morning from 6 a.m. till 8.30. Now, at 8 o'clock, they started shooting, so they would have to film the other actor's scenes until he finally got done. Two and a half hours every day. He said it was actually a nightmare. Once they put the headpiece on, the makeup, and then the costume, which was to make him look big and bulkier, he said that his body had no breathing room whatsoever. But then, when they turned the lights on to film, I felt like I was cooking inside of there. Once we were done, you could take my boots off and pour the sweat out. They had to put me on salt tablets, and I had to drink a gallon of lemonade every two hours. He said that he was suffering from constant leg cramps and back pain, but he wasn't going to stop production for anything. Too many people depended on this. By the time they started filming the second season, Fred and his wife had had another son named Evan and another daughter named Madden. It seemed like everything was going along smoothly until a new TV show debuted opposite of them, and it was called Batman. <laughs> The Batman TV series came out very strong. It was in full color and it was action packed. Each week it was climbing the ratings, heading towards number one, and it was taking hundreds of thousands of viewers directly from the monsters. Feeling the pressure, the studio trying to save the show released a full length feature film called Monster Go Home in color. Don't I look frightfully handsome in Technicolor? <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't enough. They got the word. The show was being canceled. Get the FBI. We'll do. Call Scotland Yard. Right now. Phone Batman. I got it. Car 54, where are you? Believe it or not, Fred wasn't even that disappointed. He felt like the show had ran its course. So when they all gathered around for their final cast party, Fred's last words were, now everybody can go watch Batman. After that, Fred went ahead and took six months just to spend with the family, get healthy, and reset. Then he got the itch to go back into television. So he went on auditions, and he said he went on a lot of them. But each time he was told the same thing. Sorry, Fred, you don't even need to try out. We can't use you. People relate to you as Herman Munster. It just won't work. So after two years of that, he was talking to Al Lewis, who was also in a similar situation, and he told Al, I don't care if I ever come back to Hollywood again. I'm moving to New York. Once the family was all settled in back east, Fred started to go on auditions. Now the New York television scene was for TV movies of the week, and in 1969 he got a part in Arsenic and Old Lace. Now take a good look at that picture. Who do you see? Well, that's Colonel Hogan. Yeah, Bob Crane. See how I always can slip that in? It's seven degrees of Hogan's heroes. I'm telling you. Now, he was happy he got the part, but he was also a little suspicious because he was playing a monster type of character. That same year, he got to be in the TV movie The Littlest Angel, and he was happy because his role was Patience the Guardian Angel. Then just a couple months later, he got another shot at a regular series, Anderson and Company. Let's get one thing clear. This is a place of business, not a kindergarten. Oh, you're raising your voice. <laughs> Never, under any circumstances, are the children to come in this store again without express permission from me. Never, never, never. All right. Unfortunately, the series was canceled before it barely even started. So Fred decided he would have better luck on Broadway, back to the Playhouse. So he went for a part in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. But even there, he ran into resistance. Here's an interview with his co-star, Elizabeth Ashley, on what she even heard. There was great trepidation, and all during the rehearsal period, I can remember people saying to me, I mean, right, you got Herman Munster playing Big Daddy? I mean, come on. 
but Fred went in and turned in a spectacular performance, even receiving the highest praise from the author himself. Fred brought every aspect to it that Tennessee had ever conceived of. And that's very rare when you're dealing with a playwright like Tennessee Williams. After that, Fred took a step back from auditioning. He figured, if you really want me, you'll come find me. And luckily, he had invested all his earnings over the years very wisely, just like his father, and he could live comfortably without having to look for work. This allowed him to go back to writing, but this time he wrote children's books. One time when his daughter Madden was really small, she pointed to his nose and asked, what is that? And he said, that's a mole on my nose. Then as she got older one day in the backyard, she saw a hole and said, what dug that hole? And he said, a mole. She looked up at him confused. He laughed and he never forgot that. So he put it in a book, had it published, and before you knew it, it was a hit. Next thing you know, Fred is spending the next 10 years writing children's stories, such as A Chocolate Moose for Dinner, A Little Pigeon Toad, The Pond Larker, how about The King Who Reigned? Now, during this time, Fred and his wife also grew apart, and after 28 years of marriage, they officially divorced in 1980. Fred ended up moving into an apartment in Manhattan and just continuing on writing children's books. Then in 1981, he received a phone call to be in the movie The Munster's Revenge. Well, he didn't want to do it, so he turned it down, but they kept calling back. Eventually, he decided to do a smart thing. He gave them a price so high that they had no option but to leave him alone. Instead, though, they accepted. We've been accused of terrorizing a city. We expect to clear our names, Herman. We're going to have to do something about it. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, you rascal. After filming the movie, Fred went right back into writing. And that's when he met Deborah Flater, who was in publishing at the time. The two started dating, and in 1988, they were married. They ended up buying a farm in Maryland, moving in, and just having a normal life. Then, like all the times before, Fred received a phone call, this time to be in a movie called My Cousin Vinny. Is it possible to two Utes? Uh, uh, to what? Did you say Utes? Yeah, two Utes. What is a Ute? Oh, excuse me, Your Honor. Two Utes. Man, he was great in that movie. If you haven't seen it, you need to check it out. With a role in Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, then going into disorganized crime, and then My Cousin Vinny blowing up like it did, he was back. The offers started rolling in. He said in 1992, he had five offers for movies. But before he could commit to any project, he needed to find out why his back was hurting so bad. So in January of 1993, he went in for a full checkup. The news was not good. It was worst case scenario. He had pancreatic cancer that was inoperable, and the doctors gave him six months to live. When asked what he was going to do, he said, I'm going to spend every minute of it, and I want the full six months to be with my wife, my children, and I'm going to draw and paint. And that's what he did, with his wife Deborah by his side and his children gathered around him on July 2nd, 1993, at the age of 66, Fred Gwynn passed away. One of my all-time favorites and a big reason why I'm such a Munsters fan to this day. Now something else that I discovered while making this video. Over the years, Fred's opinion on being typecast changed. He said it was Hollywood that could not see me in any other role other than Herman Munster. But for decades, people would come up to me, fans of the Munsters, fans of Herman, and they would say, oh my gosh, that show meant so much to me. We love you. Then they would ask, where are you now? What are you doing? How come we don't see you on television? They were fans of Fred Gwynn. And I love them for that. They kept me going. Now you can see on the screen right now, there's a few pictures floating around where he met fans or replied to them with a letter. And he would draw a caricature of Herman and sign it with a little word of encouragement. How lucky could you have been to be one of those people that received that? 
amazing. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please think about subscribing. I don't make them that often, and YouTube sent me a notice that said I have a low 3% subscriber ratio. That was kind of discouraging, but it's not going to stop me. I'll be back with more videos in the future. Cool classics.